Hey guys, it's Mr. Mac Addiction. Glad you could make it back. This is part two on my topic of the iPad in general aviation. I didn't want to get too lengthy on part one. Reviewed it a little. Got a few comments. A couple things I think I left out that I want to touch on today and kind of reiterate a few important points. So if you didn't see part one, click on it, check it out. This is part two. Um, I got smart, made some notes. Hey, look at that, another use for the iPad. <laughs> um, I think one big question is the iPad. Why do we use it? Why do we use it as pilots? Pretty simple, we use it for viewing charts and plates. That's a supplemental form of navigation when you integrate the GPS aspect. Enhanced situational awareness, tons of apps, georeference charts, terrain awareness, weather. Um, checklist, there's apps that have pre-created checklists for tons of aircraft out there as well as the ability to make your own. Flight planning, before we even off the, get off the ground, and the ability to file flight plans. And of course, it's a big E6B. Lots of apps, including free ones. Where you can do weight and balance, time distance, fuel burn, all kinds of typical things that we're used to doing with our E6B. One thing is what the iPad now has gotten into the realm of being an EFB, an electronic flight bag. What is it? Well, the FAA says an EFB is an electronic device for storing and the display of navigational charts approach plates, airport diagrams, departure or approach procedures, etc. It's kind of like an e-book for pilots and our and all our plates and sectionals and in route charts, etc. The FAA says it's good to go. It can be used as that. It is not a navigational device. We can't use it as a crutch for that. It can be used to supplement our navigation, like I said, with GPS, georeference charts, etc. A lot of great apps tell us where we're at very accurately. But technically it isn't a navigational device and the FAA doesn't view it as that. So, you, you know, you got to consider that. One thing I didn't discuss before, and it came up a little, is the difference between the iPad and a Windows-based EFB. What's the differences? Big one, I think, is reliability. And if you're a you know, true Windows user, I apologize. I know there's going to be some comments and debate. But I believe the iPad is just more reliable when it comes to Mac products, and I started out as a Windows user. I'm a convert, I'm a Mac user now. People ask why, and you've heard this before. It just works. Same thing, brought, by, brought to you by the same people. Turn it on and it just works. No fatal exception error, no viruses. It's something that I really trust in the air. I would be a little leery, and you can go ahead and prove me wrong, post your comments, but I'd be a little leery taking a Windows-based EFB with my sole source of approach plates on an instrument approach. We know what can happen on Windows computers at the click of a mouse or the touch of a key. Sometimes we're baffled why it happens, but it happens. And that's really the last place I want to see the big blue screen fatal exception error. And away goes my chart. So I think it is more reliable. Like I, I, and again, I apologize for you Windows users, but that's, that's my opinion. Um, battery life is another one. Uh, most Windows-based EFBs have a fairly short battery life. You know, up to 10 hours on the iPad, especially the iPad 2. Um, please, before you make your flight, fully charge your iPad. But for most of our, you know, hour, two-hour flights, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be good to go. 
Long, long battery life. The other thing is apps, aviation apps. It turns out that sometime in the last 10 years, Windows developers, software developers for aviation apps, either they gave up or they got really complacent. You know, they figured we got a product out there. People are buying it. They're renewing their subscriptions, etc., And we're happy. There's nothing, there's no reason to do anything more. Well, there is. There always is. There's always something better. You can strive for something greater. And the small amount of Windows-based aviation apps, especially in the navigation area, didn't create a lot of competition. And I think competition is necessary for that one upmanship to develop an app that does more or does it better. And you're seeing that now in the apps with the iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch from the App Store. You got a lot of developers writing a lot of apps. There's a lot of competition. That competition is good for us, the end user. So we're seeing more of those aviation apps. We're seeing updates with great new things on these apps. I think that's a plus. That's right now it's it's the source for aviation applications and software as opposed to Windows. Hopefully those Windows guys are going to hear this and maybe that'll inspire them. There's the possibility there. But right now, I think the iPad's got it. Another thing is a lot of the aviation apps for the iPad are free. A lot of great apps that are free. The ones that aren't free, really not that expensive. Even some of the bigger ones, uh, Wing X Pro, 99 bucks. Not bad, really, when you compare some of the Windows-based ones out there. And the neat thing that I like is the ability that a lot of these developers have presented through the App Store for you to get a trial version. And many of them are fully functional trial versions for 30 days, you know, a certain time period where you can use it, you can evaluate it, you can see, is this going to work for me? Does it do everything I want it to? Maybe even some communication back, back and forth between you and the developer, asking questions, things like that, and getting a feel for their kind of support for you, the end user. So that's nice because you can try it out before you buy it, before you plug down your hard-earned cash. I haven't seen that much in the Windows-based applications for aviation. There's a couple that do offer trials. One that I downloaded myself to try, it didn't even work. So we won't go there. That was a big disappointment. I guess that goes back to turn it on and it just works. Um, the other one I haven't gotten yet, I did order the CD and they're sending it to me now. Um, We'll see how that one goes and maybe I'll review that for you guys. But when you get back to the iPad apps for aviation, cheap. Even if they're not the 99 cent apps, they're still very, very reasonable. Reduce subscription rates for your data renewals and you know your charts, your plates and stuff. A lot cheaper than we're traditionally used to getting our paper ones or the Garmin subscriptions, the updates for the Garmin systems. And the ability to get trial versions to try them out. Moving beyond that, what's the safest way to get yourself familiarized both with the iPad and the app that you chose to use while you fly? I think it's kind of a step-by-step -step process. We're kind of now people in the now generation. You find an app, you can download it now, you can use it now. But until you're really familiar with it, in the air is probably not the best place to learn. I think, at least not alone in the air. Download an app. Play with it on the ground. Most of the functionality is still there. I mean, you're not moving, so you're not going to see a depiction of the aircraft moving on an approach plate, or etc. But you get used to the functions. What do I have to push to do this? What do I have to push to do that? Um... Maybe even ride as a passenger in a car. See how, what, it, what it functions like when you're moving, when you're out in the sun. That's another deal. You know, we talked about glare in part one. 
And then when you're ready to get in the plane, grab a buddy, grab a safety pilot. One of you can watch for traffic, watch for the mountains, while the other one gets familiar with the, you know, the iPad in flight and see what it can do for you as a pilot. And you can do that safely with a safety pilot. That's my thought, and I think it's a kind of a steadfast rule that we should stick to when trying out new gadgets in flight. We really don't want to be taking our eyes away from outside or off the instrument panel to play with high-tech gadgets until we're really comfortable with them. Next is weather. Talked about it briefly before, but there's one thing we really didn't discuss is how do you get weather information into your iPad? Well, right now there's basically three ways of doing it. And probably the most common is 3G data service. We know that cell phone use in the air is technically not allowed. Um, we always want to make sure our electronic devices don't interfere with our actual instruments, the radios, nav gear, etc. But 3G service is a way of getting live weather onto your iPad. One thing though is if you're out in a rural area, if there's no cell towers, it doesn't matter if you're at 6,000 feet or on the ground, 3G service could be unreliable. You could lose your weather. WX Works, WeatherWorks, it's an XM satellite service. Similar to how the Garmin portable products are getting their uh, weather information, it's the XM satellite weather. Uh, the standalone receivers are kind of pricey. They're six, seven, eight hundred bucks, depending on where you get it, new or used. But it is still a subscription service, so you're talking 30, 40 bucks a month for your weather. Right now, I don't even know of an app for the iPad that integrates XM satellite weather. And with what I'm going to talk about next, that may not even be a thing to worry about. The other way of getting weather into your iPad, and it is functional right now, today, it's a new system being implemented by the FAA, and I'm sure if you're a pilot you've heard about it. It's the Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast Service, or ADSB. God knows the FAA and us pilots love our acronyms. Right now, it's already rolled out. I'm not sure in all the areas, but it's already rolling out. FAA's timeline is all aircraft by 2020 will have the equipment in them and you will be required to have it for use in airspaces A, B, C, and E. The neat thing about this is, and it's kind of a two-part neatness, is one, the information is free. Once you have the equipment, it is free. No subscriptions. That's awesome. Right now, there is one portable receiver available for in-craft, in-aircraft use, and it integrates with several iPad apps, and it's available from SkyRadar. It's twelve hundred bucks. Small little unit transmits the weather data out of it into your iPad via Wi-Fi. I think as we see more receivers being developed and created for portable use. Um, we'll see those prices drop. But even laying out 1200 bucks up front and never have to pay a subscription again is awesome. The second part of the neatness factor of ADSB is the possibility of not only live weather, but live traffic. Right now that requires a transceiver because it transmits information from your aircraft much like a transponder, altitude, etc. to the ground. And then when the ground station senses incoming aircraft information, it relays that back out into the air for other aircraft to receive. So we do have that ability to be implemented onto the iPad apps in the future for live traffic. And that's awesome. Live traffic, live weather, no subscription. So that's pretty cool. Keep your eye out for new developments on that. If I hear anything new, I'm going to post them here.